What makes something mine? In particular, things or places that are communal or public, such as my money, my street, my train. Moving to a new city, it was interesting to observe the evolution of my relationship with my kids. How the neighborhood strangeness and otherness morphed into familiarity and ease. How its various components came to be integral to self. And how both my husband and I came to claim ownership and even possessiveness over them. Thanks to Kit, our Malaysian friend who was then based in Berlin, we had initially eyed Kreuzberg as the place in which to live. Multicultural, artistic and vibrant, it would make our stint in the city truly memorable, he enthused. Yet we couldn't find an apartment in Kreuzberg that met our rental and spatial needs. Then Kit and another friend, Fritz, advised us to seriously consider Neukölln. South of Kreuzberg, Neukölln was also multicultural and vibrant, but grungier. Still, it had nice sections and was slowly experiencing spillover from its hip and happening northern neighbor. So it came to pass that we ended up in the district with the city's largest migrant population, a real mix of poor and rich, and where we witnessed right before our eyes gentrification creep through the streets in the four years we were there. But in 2008, Neukölln had a reputation. It's just that we weren't aware of it. Soon after moving in, I went to an online expat forum and clicked on a discussion thread on our new Keats. I was horrified at what I read. However, I soon realized that the fears focused on a single event that then symbolized everything that was wrong with Neukölln. In 2006, in a school called the Rudli Schule, Teachers had written to authorities demanding the school be shut down because they could no longer deal with its violent students. The students were overwhelmingly from migrant backgrounds. The issue caused a furor about the German school system and the integration of both immigrant students into schools and immigrants in general into society. I had to search elsewhere online to learn that the Rudli Schule had since undergone a massive makeover. More importantly, daily life soon showed us that nothing beat the warmth of the Turks, Arabs and Vietnamese who befriended us, taught us German and even looked out for us. Walking through our Keats would inevitably involve a Guten Morgen exchange or a friendly wave across the street. We learned that this was not the norm in the more homogeneous neighbourhoods. The multiplicity of languages made us feel at home and there was definitely more empathy and success whenever we struggled to communicate. But in the larger world, Neukölln's bad rap remained. Mentioning that we lived in Neukölln was met at times with mild surprise, ignorance and even xenophobia, both from Germans as well as foreigners. We began to wear the badge of Neuköllners with pride and took it upon ourselves to explain what life was really like there. And the issue of integration, integration became ever more interesting to us. But then the signs of gentrification started to be noticeable. We would check out new cafes, mostly from the outside, stare as groups of young whites heaved furniture from rental vans into flats, and surely, surely that couldn't possibly be resentment that we were feeling each time we heard English being spoken on our street corner. High rentals and the lack of space in Kreuzberg were pushing the artistic, the trendy and their groupies southwards. And the upward mobility was actually being led in many cases by the migrants themselves. By the time we left Berlin, Neukölln had become the address to have. But we couldn't help feeling that the changes weren't really to our liking. Our Keats was fine the way it was. After all, our Keats was our home.